All right, welcome back to our fiber analysis lesson. This is lesson two. So if you have not already watched lesson one, make sure that you go back and do that before popping on and listening to this lesson. So just to review, we've learned about different types of fibers and their uses in forensics. Um, remember, we have two classifications of fibers. We can have natural fibers, um, which are derived from plants, animals, humans, and then we have um, excuse me, let me go back. Natural fibers, which are derived from plants, animals, and minerals. And we also have synthetic fibers, which are derived from laboratories. So they're man-made fibers. Um, and I encouraged you in the last lesson to take a look at the tags in your clothing, just to kind of see, get an idea of the different fibers um, that may have made up the clothes that you're wearing. Today, specifically, we're going to learn how investigators actually use fibers to solve crimes. Now, if you joined us in the last lesson, we looked at, um, you were supposed to research the Wayne Williams case or the Atlanta child murders. That's an example of how fibers were used to solve a crime. Um, fiber evidence is very important in a lot of different cases or has been historically important to solving a lot of cases. And fiber evidence can be gathered in different ways. So when investigators work a crime scene, they can gather fibers with vacuums, adhesives, forceps. They can pluck, they can scrape, similar to the way they gather hair samples. So it's very important for investigators um, to be very accurate when they record the location of their fiber evidence because that information is oftentimes very vital to putting together the pieces of a puzzle surrounding a crime that involves fiber evidence. So the first task in fiber analysis is to identify the fiber and its characteristics, and we're going to talk about that a little bit today. And then next, the investigator is going to want to attempt to match the fibers to a suspect or to a source. Um, sometimes that's easy to do, and sometimes that's very difficult, but it's very important work um, that an investigator has to do. So in the last lesson, we talked about fibers and textiles, um, and we need to know today that textiles can be characterized by their weave pattern. Now, there's a lot of different weave patterns, but I put three common ones on the screen. We're not going to go into a lot of detail about the different weave patterns, but I do want you to notice some differences between the two, and they can provide some unique characteristics to fibers. Now, if we want to get a quantitative measure, we can use something called a thread count to help us further identify fibers. So we have something called a horizontal thread count, which is the number of threads that run side to side. And then a vertical thread count is the number of threads that run up and down in a textile. So if I want you to um, give me horizontal or vertical thread count on a test or a quiz or a worksheet, um, what I want you to do is count the number of horizontal and vertical threads in a particular snapshot. So here on the screen, you have a snapshot of a fiber. I want you to count the horizontal, which are side-to-side -side threads, and the vertical thread counts, which are the ones that run up and down. So if you count those, you'll notice that there are six horizontal threads and then six vertical threads in this snapshot. So that's how you will um, provide this information on a test, a quiz, or a worksheet. All right, I want you to try this one. Count the number of horizontal threads and vertical threads. See what you get. All right, if you got eight for the horizontal thread count and eight for the vertical thread count, you were correct. Um, and I also want to point out those numbers are not always the same. Just so happens on these two examples, they were. All right, so let's talk about when investigators find a fiber at a crime scene, what happens next? Well, they're going to sample and test to try to figure out some specific characteristics, and then hopefully they can get some leads um, and get other fiber evidence that they can then compare to their crime scene evidence. So if there isn't sufficient uh, amounts of fibers, 
So if there's only that one or two fibers found at a crime scene, investigators are going to try to um, keep intact those fibers. They don't want to damage or compromise them in any way. So they're going to use some different techniques or methods to analyze those fibers without damaging them. The first one is polarized microscopy. And um, with this technique, basically investigators use an optical um, optical technique that involves polarized light and it identifies and characterizes fibers. Um, there is also a technique called infrared spectroscopy, which is more of a quantitative measurement. It's a measurement of the interaction of infrared radiation with matter and the way uh, it absorbs and emits or reflects um, that light. And so the goal of both of these is to use either infrared light or polarized light to discover those unique characteristics of the fibers. Now, if there is sufficient fiber evidence, investigators are going to subject these fibers to a destructive test called a fiber burn analysis. Um, and this is just a way, basically, they burn fibers and they figure out the way that they burn and they use something called a dichotomous key to sort of figure out what kind of fiber they are working with. So let me show you what um, a dichotomous key looks like. This is an example. So investigators can burn a fiber and they can follow this dichotomous key all the way down to the identity of the fiber. And so they can try to figure out if it's polyester or acrylic or acetate or cotton or hemp or silk or nylon um, by the way that it burns. And so how do they do that? Well, let's talk about some different characteristics. So synthetic fibers, synthetic fibers have a unique way in which they burn. Not all synthetic fibers follow this rule, but most do. So synthetic fibers, when they are subjected to heat, they tend to melt. Whereas natural fibers are gonna burn, synthetic fibers tend to melt. So you can actually get a synthetic fiber just close to a flame um, and it will just kind of melt away. Just a side note, when I was a kid, my dad built a fire in our fireplace and it was really cold outside. So I was really close to the fire and I had a synthetic shirt on. I can't remember what it was made of, but it was some sort of silky material. Um, and I got too close. I didn't even realize it, but I was so close to the fire that my shirt just melted away. Um, so I always think about that when we're talking about how synthetic fibers tend to melt. Synthetic fibers, after they're burned, they solidify when they're cooled. So they turn into like a plastic blob um, after they're cooled. While they're burning, they tend to give them off a chemical odor. If you've ever smelled a burning tire, this is very similar to the way a synthetic fiber smells as it burns. Natural fibers um, burn in some unique ways as well. So typically natural fibers shrink away from a flame. Um, when they ignite, if you pull them away from a flame, they tend to have these red embers that um, are at, um, like lighted ash that sticks around. Um, when they burn, they burn to ash. Oftentimes it's a light, brittle, fluffy gray ash. Um, when they burn, it smells like singed hair um, or leaves burning. Uh, so there's different characteristics and investigators get really good at noting these characteristics. And then again, they use something like a dichotomous key, like you see on the screen, to identify the source from which that fiber was derived. All right, so that ends our, let me just make sure, Yes, that ends our fiber lesson, and um, if you are in my class, we're going to do a fiber burn lab. Um, if you're not, your teacher will tell you what you're going to do next.